Well hello there and you join us here today to have a look at Seiko. Maybe you're thinking about buying your first and you've got a whole bunch of questions. Hopefully we can answer them. This is what you should know before you buy a Seiko. Tom, as someone who has recently entered the world of spending all their money on watches, you have personally discovered Seiko and you've had quite an experience with it as I understand. Yeah, Seiko was a bit of an eye-opener for me. When I started a watch finder, we only really deal in luxury Swiss watches most of the time, and I was kind of priced out of that. So I didn't think that there was any way to enjoy decent watches. I thought, you know, there was Casios, which is something else, and then, you know, your Rolexes and your Omegas and everything. And it was only until I saw a Seiko with a mechanical movement inside in an exhibition case, I could see the movement, and it was only 300 quid. I was like, oh, I didn't realise. I thought Rolexes and everything were were Formula One cars and there weren't any road cars, but Seiko, I think, is that just a normal kind of road car that everyone can enjoy a driving experience. That's my driving analogy, but obviously <laughs> we're talking about telling the time. Well, you have been through a journey of discovery and learned quite a few things along the way, and I'm hoping that we can take some of that knowledge and impart it to our listeners who might also be thinking about joining you to save them some time and effort, because there are some interesting quirks around Seiko that I think people need to know before they buy one. Tom, what's some of the uh, things that you noticed when you were researching Seiko? So there's Seiko, but there's lots of brands and models and naming conventions under the Seiko umbrella. So you've got things like you've got Seiko and Grand Seiko, and there's quite a big difference between those two things. You've also got things like King Seiko and Crador as well, which I'd never heard of until you handed me one and I went, what is this? Um, I thought it was like a one-off because it was just so, it looked like it was handmade by like a master watchmaker. That's the sort of levels that, that the Seiko brand can get to. It can be especially confusing, I think, because you can buy a Seiko for several thousand and you can also buy a Grand Seiko for several thousand and you can also find Cradles for several thousand. So it's supposed to be Seiko at the bottom, then King Seiko slightly above, then Grand Seiko above that, and then Cradle, but they all kind of mix and match a bit. Yeah, they overlap. They really do. It's a very muddy grey area. So when you're looking for a Seiko in particular, do your research. If you're looking to spend £3,000 on a Seiko, you might find a really, really nice Grand Seiko and get more bang for your buck there. Another thing to note is uh, Seiko is Japanese. In some circles, that might be a bit of a neddy no-no when it comes to luxury watches. Some people might say Swiss or GTFO. Um, <laughs> but actually, there's a lot of history there behind Seiko. It's been going a long time, just as long as many of these prestigious Swiss brands. Yeah, most people might not realise that Seiko was founded before Rolex by quite a substantial amount. This is 1881 for Seiko versus 1905 for Rolex. This is a watchmaker that has made watches for train services, a watchmaker that has timed the Olympics. It's done a load of really, really impressive stuff. As you mentioned, the Crador is some of the highest watchmaking you can get. They make minute repeaters. This as a brand is incredibly well respected. So you can enjoy a Seiko and not think, oh, I've bought a cheap watch. It's not respected in the community. Very much the opposite. They are incredibly well respected. Anything that you've been looking at in buying a Seiko where you're still a little bit uncertain? I, I saw a thing the other day where there was a new Seiko come out and it had the wrong glass in the dial. And <laughs> I, I don't get that granular. But yeah, so I'm not sure... I think, you know, Seiko have got their own proprietary mineral crystal or something going on, or it's not quite the right glass. I don't know if they're cutting corners there. What's going on? So in some of the Seikos, they use sapphire, which is generally regarded to be the best material for crystal. It's very scratch resistant. Yeah. It's very strong. It's only down one from diamond, from the hardest substance in the world, but it's a little bit more expensive. At the other end, you have mineral crystal, which is less scratch resistant, easier to damage, but still pretty hardy. Smack bang in the middle of those two things, you've got Seiko's proprietary material called Hardlex, which isn't as soft as mineral, isn't as hard as sapphire, but sits nicely between the two. And it's one of the many things that Seiko does to make watches high enough quality, but really high performing in pretty much every aspect where you wouldn't see that kind of performance for another brand at that price. 
So yeah, it's not necessarily the wrong crystal, it's not as good as it could be, but really it's a balance of everything else that makes up why you would end up buying a Seiko. What's one of your favourite things about the Seiko? You mentioned seeing the movement. Yeah, that was, that was really my in because mechanical watches are where it's at. To be able to get a mechanical watch and be able to see it as well through the case back for Seiko prices is, is great. And that, that blew my mind when I saw that. I was like, oh, wow, I can enjoy the same thing as a, as a Rolex owner, essentially. <laughs> well, only very recently have Rolex owners been able to enjoy the same thing as a Seiko <laughs> yeah. owner. Yeah, right. And, and being able to see the movement. Obviously, it's not as highly finished as, as some of the other luxury watch brands out there. You know, on a, on a Seiko 5, for example, you're not going to get Geneva striping on the road to weight or whatever, or Osaka striping. But it's still there. It's, it's in there and it's ticking away and it's a wonderful thing. So that's great. Some people are really against seeing a mechanical movement when it isn't highly decorated. I'm not really sure why, because the enjoyment of the mechanism should really be universal. They are well made. They're not necessarily pretty, but they are well made. One thing to bear in mind is some of the more affordable movements have less accuracy than you might expect. So a Rolex within cost specification might be within two seconds or so, but sometimes a Seiko could be up to 20 seconds a day. That's quite a big uh, deviance. But nevertheless, again, what's the alternative? If you want a mechanical watch where you can see the movement, it winds itself, you can enjoy all of the functions that come with it, you don't really have anywhere else to go. And it's one of the reasons why so many other micro brands will take Seiko movements and use them in their own watches, purely because they're affordable, they're easy to maintain, they're very reliable, and makes sense to me to buy one that's already in a Seiko. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Tom, if you had any advice for our uh, viewers and listeners when it comes to buying or browsing for a Seiko, what would you say? Set aside a few hours if you're browsing Seiko's website for a Seiko, um, <laughs> because there are a lot of subcategories when it comes to, well, Seiko alone has, before you even get into Grand Seiko and Crador and King Seiko, Seiko alone has several subcategories. You've got Prospects, which is the professional specification, you know, your divers and such. You've got Presage, which is the more elegant sort of handcrafted corner of Seiko. You've got Seiko 5, which is your most affordable. That's your sort of casual street style cool stuff. And then you've got Astron. I don't even know what that is. And yeah, so there's and, and then within each of those, there are hundreds of watches sometimes. So yeah, I mean, you can browse around and stumble upon something that really, really takes your fancy, or you can have something in mind and you can probably find it based on your criteria. But yeah, it can be pretty overwhelming because they have such a huge range. I mean, even within the Seiko 5 collection, you've got Field Designs, Flieger Collection, Stealth, GMT SKX Reinterpretation, and then you've got all of that street style, sports style. Yeah. It's... It's worse than trying to find the thing you're looking for on Amazon. Yeah, well, I mean, there's and there's loads of Seikos on Amazon that aren't in the current catalogue as well. So, you know, <laughs> before you even start. It is an absolute minefield. And to be honest, I think the best advice is to learn from others. Take a look at the kinds of watches that other people have done their research on, and you'll find there are some firm favourites within the catalogue. It'll save you a whole bunch of time. But if you're the kind of person who likes to drill down into the detail, oh boy, Seiko have got some detail waiting for you. <laughs> well, there you go. Those are our five big know-hows for approaching the Seiko brand. Hopefully it demystifies some of the experience for you and leaves you free to enjoy the search for your next watch. There are plenty, they are all really good and you'll really enjoy whichever one you get. If you have any other hot tips for Seiko buyers, why not pop them down in the comments below to share and share alike. And if you like this series, do let us know what other brands you'd like to see it for and pop that down in the comments below too. Please also like and subscribe and we will see you next time. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>